Okay, so this is a normal uh, description of a normal or visual aid of a normal alveoli. So kind of like a balloon, right? Um, now, it's holding air, it's bouncy, it still has some elasticity, and then what happens when we let go? All the air comes out and is able to exhale and get rid of everything fairly easily. Okay, so that is our normal alveoli. Let me grab my marker. So we got our normal alveoli here. So a normal person. Okay. And then now we have our COPD people. Okay. Or the shopping bag, as I like to call it. So now this is their alveoli. I don't have a tiny shopping bag, I just have this big one. So I'm going to put a little bit of air into it, and then I'll show you we've lost elasticity and it won't recoil. All right, so we have some air leaks. I got little holes, and that actually is pretty accurate to COPD. You might have some structural changes that um, air doesn't stay in as well, but the main problem is that what happens if we open it up? The air doesn't really come out all that well, okay? So it doesn't really necessarily deflate, and so that's how you get your air trapping, because there's no recoil, no elasticity, and so now we're trapping tons of air. Okay, so now if we keep going, we have a, like we were talking about, we have a loss of surface area, okay? So first we started out with these little tiny, lovely grapes. So we got a bunch of grapes. And these represent our alveoli, okay? So we have a nice healthy little bunch of grapes. They all hold air. So you can imagine they're a bunch of little tiny balloons. Well, what happens, in COPD is we start to lose, whether because of scarring or uh, tons of inflammation, uh, tons of mucus, we start to lose surface area. So now all these walls are gone. And now instead of a bunch of little tiny balloons, we have one big giant shopping bag. Great. Not great, okay? So now we've lost surface area because if you did an equation where you added up the area of every single balloon on that alveoli, uh, of the bunch of balloons, right? Or you took the surface and then compared it to the surface area of our big giant balloon or bag that doesn't hold air, we have less surface area now and that poses a major problem. Okay, so loss of surface area okay so now we have no mo what what are we losing surface area what takes place on the surface area we got an exchange of gases right so no more gas exchange that's gone we have no more um, obviously they're able to do some gas exchange um, but we have a much less okay so why don't we just say less gas exchange so we got less gas exchange occurring. All right, now we have a loss of, like we were talking about with our shopping bag, it didn't deflate. As soon as I opened it up, it didn't deflate. It just kind of, you know, left a little bit of air out, okay? So now we have a loss of elasticity. So it's not able to be elastic anymore. And then we also lose our recoil because it can't, uh, contract all the way back in, okay? And then because of that, we end up with hyperinflation, like we were talking about up here. So we have a hyperinflation, loss of gas exchange, loss of elasticity and recoil. Then we have no more or much less. What's our little airway sweepers? We got these little guys, and they're like the airway, our large airway and small airway cleaning crew. So they're little hairs, kind of like the fine hairs on the sweep end of a broom. So we call them, from a histological uh, point of view, we call them cilia, the little ciliated membranes. And they're like a nice little one-way escalator. They go whoop, and they bring everything all the way back up, all the gunk, all the mucus, and they take it back up to the top of our airway where we can uh, expel it and cough it out. So they're very helpful. But with cigarette smoke and other you know, risk factors and whatnot that damage those airways, especially cigarette smoke, 
It will actually kill those um, ciliated membranes, and it turns them into something else. It turns them into a different type of cell. Starts with an SQU, and they're nice and flat, and they don't necessarily do, they don't have the ciliated membrane uh, capacity. So now we change into squamous cells. Okay, so we've changed our cilia over to squamous. And I'll put it right here. So now we have squamous. And our little airway sweepers are gone. They are no more. All right. So then now we have snot, more snot, more mucus, more goop, whatever you want to call it. We're going to call it mucus, I guess, to be uh, technical. But so now we have a buildup of snot, mucus, and goop because our little cleaning crew isn't working anymore. All right, and then we have more inflammation because the more goop and snot that you can't clear away, the more inflamed those cells become, and then you have an inflammatory process that's happening. It's a bit of a downward spiral. Okay, so now we have, let's get rid of our <laughs> shopping bag. So what are we going to do in the ER for these folks? Okay, um, there are a specific set of treatments that we do in the ER. Now, I'm not talking about everyday management for COPD folks when they're just at their baseline. I'm talking about what we do when they're having an exacerbation. So this is much different than how we treat them every day at home. All right, so we want to give them some inhaled stuff. Now we talked about how we have a problem with inflammation. We have a problem with lots of snot. Huh, okay, so there's probably some things that we can give them to counteract that, right? So if we want to, oh, for open, if we want to open up their airways or dilate them, we got to give them something inhaled, right? And we all know this one. We're going to give them an inhaled bronchodilator or beta agonist, okay? And that is known as our little friend albuterol, okay? So we're going to give them albuterol in an inhaler. That opens up, okay? And then the dose is up there. We got 2.5 milligrams, usually in a nebulizer. You can also give it to them in a spacer. Um, the multi-dose inhaler with the spacer, and uh, or a continuous nap. So um, inhaled. We also want in that inhaler, and they call it a duo nap. So duo means two, right? And one of the medications is albuterol. So that's our bronchodilator beta agonist. Open up all those large and small airways so that more air can get in. Well, then we also want an inhaled. We want to do something to dry up the goop. How do we dry things up? There's a certain medication you can give people to dry up their mucus when you have an allergy or uh, something, you know, you, you take an antihistamine, right? Antihistamines dry things up, but they also, an antihistamine is a type of anti, anti-cholinergic, okay? So our anti-cholinergic drug classes like Benadryl um, or like some of our uh, H1 and H2 blockers, um, they help to dry things up a little bit, okay? So our inhaled anticholinergic is, sorry, known as, I always spell it wrong because I put the R in the wrong place, ipratropium or atrovent, okay? So we do the duo neb that's got the albuterol and the epitropium for the atrovent. Okay, and you can also do uh, that in a spacer as well. So now we've opened them up. Now we're drying them up. We want to give them something to help with the inflammation. Remember, we have a pro another problem we have to solve. So we've solved the closed airway. We've opened it. We've solved the dry. Or, I mean, we solved the, you know, goop. We're trying to solve it by drying them up. And now we're going to give them something to help with the inflammation. Okay. So... What's an anti-inflammatory medication we can give them that would help with inflammation? Could we give them an NSAID? Uh, I guess, but that, that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, so that won't really act specifically where and do what we need it to do to the degree that we need it. Um, we want an IV, 
glucocorticoid. What are those? Otherwise known as a steroid, right? IV steroids. Um, so if I, if you're in an acute at, um, COPD exacerbation and you come to the ER and I gave you oral prednisone, right? That's that's the oral version. That's going to take a couple days to start working. As little as 24 hours, but sometimes um, up to a couple days. Well, with our IV glucocorticoids, these only take six hours at, at the minimum, sometimes longer, um, 8 to 12. Um, and then we have methylprednisolone, and that is what we give them. So methylprednisolone, or otherwise known as solumedrol, is what you probably heard. And we do 60 to 125 milligrams, depending on the patient. Okay. So now we've taken care of the inflammation. We're taking care of the dryness. Or, I mean, we're taking care of the excess mucus by drying them out. We're opening them up. Now, what do we want to do as far as for the patient that is kind of our non-pharmacological stuff? So here's our non-farm stuff. And, and... Again, obviously our non-pharmacological things can be doing, we can be doing those things before we initiate the pharmacological stuff. Okay, so we're gonna, there, we wanna sit them up, right? They won't let you lay them down, trust me. If you try to lay them down, they will sit up. If you don't have the bed, let's say you have the bed, the head of the bed all the way down, they won't care, they'll just sit up because their survival instinct to breathe is so acute that they will, that will take over and they'll just sit up. So we want to support them a little bit with the head of the bed, and so try to get crank that head of the bed up as much as possible so that they're comfortable and they can breathe as well as they can. Now we want oxygen, and yes, it is a pharmacological treatment, uh, but we don't necessarily need an order for it, and so that's why I've included it in our non-farm. And we want to keep the SATs. Now these folks, their room air SATs, depending on how bad their COPD is, but their room air SATs, they probably hang out between you know, 88 to 92, 93 maybe. Um, so they're kind of on the lower end, right? And so that's kind of where they live, and we don't want to hyper-oxygenate them. So we're going to give them, we want to keep their saturations between 98 to 92. Um, we don't want to hyper-oxygenate, okay? So whatever their O2 is, then you would titrate their oxygen to keep it between 88 to 92. All right, let's talk about our diagnostic tests in the ER. What are we going to do for these folks? Well, they have an airway issue, which means we've got oxygenation problems. And so what type of blood test would we be able to check their blood pH, their oxygenation, their CO2? Uh, you see where I'm going? We need an APG, an arterial blood gas. Okay. Then we also need a CBC because... We need to make sure they don't have any other underlying pathology um, that's making them tired or dysmic. Because if you have severe anemia, severe enough, you can actually be have shortness of breath and dyspnea because you don't have enough oxygen. Um, there's not enough hemoglobin carrying your oxygen. So we need to make sure they're not anemic. And then also, we need to check their lights, electrolytes, and their kidneys. How do we do that? We do that with a basic metabolic panel. Um, also known as a Chem 8, because there's eight results from that uh, lab test. Okay, now we're going to check their chest with the radiology equipment. We just do a regular chest x-ray. These folks probably can't stand long enough for a two-view, and so they usually just do a one-view right in the ER, otherwise known as a portable chest. So portable chest is a one-view, and then the PA lateral, that's our two-view. Okay. And then we have, we want to do this, why? We want to rule out. What do, what do we want to rule out with these people? Well, they could be dysmic and have oxygenation issues for other reasons, right? And other acute reasons that could potentially be lethal if we don't figure it out. So heart failure, right, can have similar symptoms. Um, pneumonia, we want to make sure they don't have pneumonia going on, which they, they very well might um, because they're compromised in their lungs. And then we also want to make sure these people don't have a spontaneous pneumo, okay? Sometimes they have little blebs and they can rupture them depending on how violent their coughing is. And let's spell pneumo right. <laughs> okay, so uh, we want to make sure that that's not what's going on. Um, we also, if it's flu season, 
we want to flu swab them. And then obviously now in day and age in our current pandemic, there's other testing you're going to be doing as well. You're going to be checking other viral stuff, right? Okay, and then we have our EKG, because we want a 12 lead. Make sure their heart rhythm is okay, and that they're not getting into um, the really bad, like right, sorry, right-sided heart failure. Okay, um, so now we monitor continuously a bunch of things. So we're gonna monitor our O2, obviously, that's basic. And then we're gonna do a continuous five lead, EKG at the bedside, you know, on our bedside monitor. Um, most places do five leads now in the ER. Some ERs still do three. It just depends. So just you know, go with whatever your hospital has. But you want to be continuously monitoring um, their um, telemetry. Okay. Uh, and then we got respiratory status. These people aren't feeling well. And the problem is the respiratory system, and so we want to, they decline rather quickly. They're working very, very hard, and that tripod breathing and everything that comes along with it is very exhausting to all the muscles, and so eventually they're going to tire out. So we want to keep a really close eye on them because uh, we want to see if their respiratory is getting better or declining. Okay, um, then we want to talk about our changes in level of consciousness. So when someone is going into from distress to failure, you're gonna see a major decline in their level of consciousness. They'll go from panicked anxiety mode to I don't care mode because I'm dying. And then that's when they're in failure, okay? So during distress, respiratory distress, let's talk about the difference between how we recognize distress versus failure. So distress, they're still fighting. They're still working really, really hard, but eventually they're gonna tire out, and so we need to intervene. So let's talk about distress. What do we hear with lung sounds during respiratory distress? Well, usually you hear a decrease in lung sounds, or you may not hear a whole lot. You may hear just some nasty wheezing all throughout, and you can't hear anything else. Or if they're going over into the distress mode, you may not hear lung sounds at all, right? They're not moving any air whatsoever. So we might start out with some wheezing and some crackles in the bases, like we were talking about earlier, and then we're gonna go to no sounds, okay? Then our level of consciousness, uh, we're gonna be anxious during our distress phase, and then we're gonna go to sleepy, uh, sedated, you know, they look slightly sedated, uh, they're really, really starting to tire out at this point, okay? Um, and then we have uh, work of breathing, right? So during the distress mode, they're really working hard. They're doing all the positioning they can, right? They are tripoding, they're doing the neck hyperextension. Oh, I forgot to talk about uh, nasal flaring. They're going to flare out those nostrils so they can pull in as much air as possible. So all that work of breathing, so we got our nasal flaring, we have tripod, we got our neck extension, right? And then we move over to work of breathing during distress or from distress to failure. Now in failure, they're not working anymore. They're done. They're tired and they're done, they're finished. So in distress, usually they have stopped fighting and they're not as anxious. Um, okay, so if we have a change in our level of consciousness, a decline, rather, from anxiety or fight or flight all the way down to just plain old tired out, then we know we are in respiratory failure. So that's how you tell the difference between respiratory distress and respiratory failure. So in distress, again, they're anxious, and then failure, they have a major decline in level of consciousness, and you're in some serious trouble if you don't intervene. So usually we intervene in this mode, and give their lungs a break before we get to that mode. Because once they're in that mode, it's hard to turn it around, so we try to turn it around over here. And they usually will stick them on the non-invasive ventilator thing, and that's otherwise known as our BiPAP, and that will give their lungs a bit of a break and help them to deflate and inflate. Okay, and that is the end of the video. Thanks, guys.